Welcome all of you to Bible study on the first Sunday of the new year, first Bible study of 2021. We are finishing up what we had begun last summer, the study of the epistle or letter, really the sermon to the Hebrews. And so we'll read the final verses today and talk about them. And then next Sunday, as was promised, we will wrap up and review with a visual tour through the, the book of Hebrews. And we'll look at all of the saints through whom God uh, blessed and sent mercy in the Old Testament on into the New Testament, and really look at the rich liturgical heritage of Hebrews. The other thing I want to do to wrap up next Sunday, if as much time as we get for it, is to actually sing a couple of the hymns that are really directly inspired by Hebrews. And some of them are just straight out of Hebrew. Some of them are new, some of them are old, but they're beautiful hymns. And you'll find that they just they take their words and thoughts directly out of this wonderfully rich book or letter or sermon to the Hebrews. So that'll complete our Christmas joy and our Hebrews joy and Epiphany joy uh, today and the next Sunday. As you know, we, we haven't had a, a full hour of Bible study on a Sunday, probably six weeks now. Uh, last Sunday, uh, you know, we were gone as far as studying the book of Hebrews. The one before that was the children's Christmas service. And we had three Sundays in Advent where I was leaving early to practice with them. So now we'll get kind of back into the swing of things. We'll complete this study. And then after next Sunday, we'd like to look at some of the Psalms, which is our prayer book and our hymn book. It's the longest book of the Bible. It's very important and central to our life of daily prayer and of weekly worship. And there's so many wonderful prophecies about Christ in the Psalms written a thousand years before he was incarnate. I also want to do something we did earlier this past year, again, which is to study some hymns so that we can actually look at them and look at the words, look at who wrote the tune, who wrote the, the words and when, and what, what was his or her life like? And, and most importantly, where in the Bible do these words come from and how are they inspired by the God-breathed words of the Bible to write beautiful hymns and music for us to sing at home and in church? So please turn with me now today to Hebrews 13, and we're gonna resume at verse 17 and just go all the way to the end of the chapter. Hebrews 13. And we are going to start at verse 17. Now, as we looked at, you might remember this from three Sundays ago, that there's a number of different things that the preacher to the Hebrews is doing here. He's summarizing the main points of the sermon. He is, even in chapter 13, repeats himself a couple of times from the first section on into the second. And then he's also giving greetings, okay? So there's a couple of blessings or benedictions, and then the, it ends more like a letter than it does like a sermon. There's like a, a blessing, and then there's some greetings. So what's interesting about greetings in the old days is there are several features, and you can look at the greetings at the beginning and at the end of Paul's letters for some examples, or Peter's letters, right? Or James's letter. So at the beginning, there's a greeting. It identifies the writer and the speaker, and then usually also the audience, and maybe anyone who is writing or speaking with Paul or whoever wrote the letter, and then the intended recipients. At the end of the letter, there's usually a blessing, but then also some greetings, whether to particular people or to groups of people or to churches, right? So they're written to Christians like in the city of Rome. That's who Romans was written to. Or they're written to churches in a region like Galatia. That's who Galatians was written to. Hebrews, we're just really not sure. We're not sure to this day who wrote it and to whom it was written. So that's why we classify it as more of a general epistle or a general book or writing that it, it really, like all of them, applies to Christians of all times and places. But because it's not identified who's speaking and to whom, we don't have many clues about that. But we do know that it's breathed by God the Spirit and that it's beneficial to Christians of every time and place. So let's start at verse 17 here and just read uh, Hebrews 13, 17 to 19. Could I have a volunteer to read there, please? Thank you, Brian. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls 
as those who will have to give an account, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would, have, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. Urge, I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. Okay, thank you. You're going to get a little bit of a few hints in this, these last few sections that sound like Paul. Obviously, we have more examples of Paul's writing than any other New Testament writer. In fact, he wrote right about half of the New Testament books. He wrote 13 letters that we have in the Bible, and there's 27 books in the New Testament. So we have a lot of examples of Paul's writing. And whoever wrote this, some people think it was Paul, some people think it was one of his uh, co-workers or other apostles, and many think that it was uh, just a, a pastor like Timothy, somebody who had been taught by Paul or by another apostle and was just teaching and preaching to his congregation. And so when he says uh, that I may be restored to you the sooner, there's a tiny little clue. It sounds like the, the author is absent. So when you had these letters in the old days, there were greetings, and the author would greet the people there along with other folks, right? I send you greetings from Timothy or from Epaphroditus or Sosthenes or whoever, right? I bring you greetings from this person or that person or the churches here or there. And then they would also encourage the folks there to greet each other, which you'll see here. And then they, they also encourage greet, reciprocal greetings, right? So these letters were meant to be circulated around to the different churches. They were meant to be copied. They were meant to be read out loud during church. And Paul has a reference to that in one of the letters to the Thessalonians. So you can see here the use of these letters, that they, they get around, right? They, they don't just spread by word of mouth. They're actually circulated, copied, and read out loud in the churches to the people of God from the ministers and servants of the people of God. And even in that, uh, he goes back again to verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. So you'd usually think that's talking about government or secular leaders, right? And there are exhortations to do that in plenty of places, especially like in Romans 13 or in 1 Peter. But he's talking here, it becomes pretty clear, about spiritual leaders because he says they are keeping watch over your, over your souls. Now, does the, does the state or the government keep watch over your soul? No. And not only does it not do that, it ought not do that and has no right to do that. Right? The state or the government governs your affairs, right? It has something to do with your money, your property, your uh, privileges and, and rights and responsibilities as a citizen. It does not watch over your soul. And it does not give you the forgiveness of sins or baptize you or commune you or visit you or teach you the word of God, right? That's not why God instituted it. He did institute servants and leaders in the church to do that. Right? And from a very early age, like Paul says to Timothy, right, your mother and your grandmother, Eunice and Lois, right? He could include your deaconesses and deacons, your Sunday school teachers, your pastors and ministers, your directors of Christian education, and your Christian teachers. All of those folks, as well as your family members who taught you the faith, are those leaders to whom we should submit. Submitting is a bad word today, isn't it? You can't just say the word submit. <coughs> It'll make people very uncomfortable. And yet, the Holy Spirit says it, and it's actually not a bad word, and it's actually a good word, and we should not be scandalized or offended by it. Submitting is voluntary, first of all, right? There's no hint of leaders forcing those whose souls they oversee to submit to them, right? or demanding it or requiring it. This is voluntary submitting to those who lead, teach, preach, exhort, visit, commune, baptize, and so on. And the same is true when you look at Ephesians, because that's where you hear God's instructions for husbands and wives, right? Husbands love your wives and wives submit to your husbands. There's no inequality here, just voluntary submission and walking alongside of and listening and speaking and working together for the good of God's people. And the verse right before all that says to everybody, submitting to one another out of love for God. That's for everybody. 
in every calling and vocation, submitting one to another, just as Jesus submits to his Father. If you think there's any inequality between us who submit to each other, you would have to imply that there's inequality between God the Father and his Son. So that's a big deal. And that, that submitting, again, is voluntary, it's gracious, it's joyful, and it is voluntary. It is a good thing to submit to leaders. And keep in mind that they keep watch over your souls. I think we even refer to that. I think our church records have something, or they say something like a, a soul record or something like that, a record of souls. Because, we, yeah, we keep track of people's bodies and residents and lives and, you know, their health and things like that. Those are important. But the soul is most important, isn't it? Because the soul is that aspect of us, that, that part of us that goes to be with the Lord when we die, and which is reunited with our body in the resurrection, and which gives life to our body, and it is immortal. So we wouldn't want to focus on just on the body, which lasts for this long, and neglect the soul, which endures forever. So keeping watch over the soul. Now, th this is your duty, too. It's not just the duty of the folks around you and your spiritual leaders. You should also keep watch over your soul and that of others. But there's this, uh, this soul accounting. And that, that's why we have the numbers. That's why we track who comes each week and who's baptized and confirmed and communing. And even things like getting married, right? Certainly being born and, and dying, right? These are... These are not just numbers, these are people, these are souls whom Christ loves and for whom he died and rose from the dead. So we'll have to give an account. What does that mean? I have to give an account. No, he better, whoever this person is should be actually Doing what they're supposed to be doing. Doing what they're supposed to be doing. How do you know what they're supposed to be doing? He does. <laughs> the second part is true. He does, right? And the first part is, in it's in the Bible. Yeah, we went over this with the elders uh, for months now. We've gone through First and Second Timothy and Titus. And there's other places too, like Hebrews and First Peter. Of course, the Lord's words to Peter and the apostles come first, and then the apostles' words to us as well. I mean, there are very specific requirements for the office of the ministry and other offices in the church, and not just about the doctrine that you teach, that's very important, but also about the life that you live, right? So both what you say and what you do. So the requirements are clear. They're there. They're in the Bible. They're breathed out by the Spirit, and uh, they have to give an account. Um, when and how will this happen? Uh, certainly on the last day. Right. Lord, here are the 600 something people that <laughs> or the 300 members or the 50 souls or whatever that came to our church, that heard the word of God, that received the Lord's Supper, that believed with faith in their heart that Christ is their good shepherd who died and rose from the dead for them. Here they are, uh, sir, all present and accounted for. And then the Lord will not pat those leaders on the head and say, you know, well done, you, you got them into heaven, <laughs> right? He will say, uh, blessed are you, and they will go into the same eternal life as everyone else, right? But there is that accounting, and it's like at the end of the day, you know, you've, you're responsible for the, the books or the ledger that you keep. You're responsible for the hours that you put in. You have to give an account of the work that you did, especially when your boss is away, right? When your boss is there, it's one thing, but but when he's gone and you've got to say, look, I got this done and I got it done in this amount of time and so on, um, there, is a, there is an accounting. We do have to give an account. It does not mean, once again, that, uh, that anyone in the church will be saved by his or her own works or merit. It does mean that we'll report to the Lord, our master, we are his servants, and uh, he will give us what we do not deserve, which is eternal life by his grace through faith. So let them do this with joy and not with groaning. Did you ever teach or do a job or something like that or any, anything 
where it was uh, it wasn't fun it was difficult and people made it worse by just complaining the whole time <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I mean and sometimes we're the ones doing that right and uh, you, you do something joyfully it, it's like 90 percent the attitude that you bring into it and about 10 percent the actual work isn't it it's your perspective on it instead of uh, here we go again it's thank the lord for a new day even if you don't feel like it you know try it out encourage others be encouraged by the word of god don't do it with groaning but with joy because that won't be of any advantage to you you know there's a huge difference between a, a pastoral or a church visit with someone who doesn't want to get visited <laughs> and might even be angry or argumentative and someone who's joyful and is glad that you're there and actually care, is glad that you care enough to call on them. Huge difference. So I keep that in mind, uh, not with groaning, but with joy. It is a joyful thing to be sheep of our good shepherd. And uh, one day to give an account for the, for the things that he has given us in this life. And then verse 18, again, Paul does this quite a bit. So it sounds like him, although it's something that every Christian leader should say, pray for us, right? Pray for us. And, uh, and, and don't just say, I'm praying for you, but actually pray, right? Actually pray for your leaders and for all Christians. Pray for those in the prayer of the church, folks in need. And pray that we may have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. What's a clear conscience? Guilt-free. Yeah, guilt-free. I mean, who, who lives entirely guilt-free? Nobody should. <laughs> Nobody should. Yeah, really. I mean, to some extent, it's a, it's a healthy thing. That you, I mean, if you feel that you haven't ever done anything wrong or couldn't have done anything better, there's a bigger problem there. The other problem is constantly feeling guilty about everything, right? and thinking, you know, I can never do anything perfectly, and I don't even want to try because it's going to fail somehow, right? There's a happy medium in which we know that our sins should cause us guilt, and they do, and we take that guilt to the Lord and hear his word of forgiveness and leave it there, and, and just keep on moving, and just live in the grace of God with a clear conscience. So a clear conscience doesn't mean you've never felt guilty or never could have done something better. A clear conscience says, Lord, I've sinned. Please forgive me. You love me in Christ. I love you in return through faith. Help me to love my fellow neighbor and help me have the resolve and comfort of your word to get on with each day. So there's a, there's a clear conscience that uh, our guilt is forgiven and buried at the cross of Christ. And then I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. I like how Paul ends a lot of his letters by promising to visit people and say, you know, I hope to get to you soon. I'm hoping to visit Spain eventually. I want to get to you guys in Rome. I'd love to come back and visit you in Corinth or in Ephesus or Galatia or, or Philippi or anywhere else. Um, he, uh, he longs to visit the people of God and rejoices in their partnership and fellowship in the gospel. So he urges you to, to do this. Yeah, and a lot of that's repeated. Uh, back in verse 7, he had already said, remember your leaders, right? Who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So he kind of says it again here in verse 17. He already mentioned the, the death of Christ in verse 12. Now he'll mention it again in verse 20. And then he'll give a couple of blessings to us too. So uh, could we have another reader, please, to read this wonderful benediction and blessing, verses 20 and 21. Thank you, Bonnie. Now may the God of peace be brought again. Be brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal Amen. Isn't that a beautiful blessing? It's the, the picture I chose for this section. It's on the Zoom Bible study. It'll be on our visual overview of the whole letter next Sunday. Uh, the great shepherd of the sheep. So you know that he's the what? 
the good shepherd. And here he's called the, the great shepherd. You don't ever hear that, really. You don't hear of a great shepherd Lutheran church or anything, right? But it's awesome. I think it's great, great shepherd. And, you, you know, the good shepherd is uh, it's taught in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He's taught in Ezekiel, right? I myself will shepherd the sheep. And in Jeremiah, he's taught even in the life of David and Amos and other prophets who were shepherds by occupation. It's taught by Christ in John 10. I am the good shepherd, right? The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And, and then it's also taught again in 1 Peter, right? The good shepherd and overseer or bishop of your souls. So many times Christ is called the good shepherd. And then you get this beautiful image of him uh, shepherding his sheep. I'm going to go get this picture over here. Have you ever seen this? It's just tucked in the corner on this bulletin board. And you might just walk by it and not see it very often. But I really like this. I'm going to reach back there and grab it. Have you ever seen this one? It's kind of small. Maybe we should pass it around. I'll show it first to the folks on the, on the screen here. It's, it's by our council announcements. I, one of the more famous paintings of Christ the Good Shepherd. And it's got the sheep all around him. Some are lying by the living water in the green pasture. Some are right next to him. There's the black sheep of the family, see? Right? And then he's holding the little lamb in his arms. So when we went to Missouri a couple days ago, uh, that very morning, uh, a couple, uh, two lambs had been born that very day. And so the kids got to hold them. Cutest little things, right? And their little bat and all this. Looking around for mom, right? It was feeding time and all the adults were eating. And the lambs were running around trying to, trying to find mom. Like, hold up, I want to eat too. <laughs> And it was awesome. And then, of course, using different fences and their big, really friendly dog, the folks who own these sheep were shepherding them. And I thought, that's awesome. That, that'll have to get into a sermon somehow, someday. So pass that around and take a look. It is a beautiful picture of Christ, our good shepherd, and be his sheep. This blessing, you know, there's a lot of blessings and benedictions in the Bible. Which one do we hear the most often? We just heard it again this morning. It is sung to us, and uh, we sing three amens in response at the very end of the service, right? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord and be gracious to you. The Lord yet lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, right? There's six little blessings. There's three times that the Lord's name is mentioned because he's Father, Son, and Spirit. This is actually not a New Testament blessing. We heard it Thursday night with the circumcision and name of Jesus. It's all the way back in the Old Testament that we got that blessing, right? It's in Numbers chapter 6, and the Lord is telling Aaron and Moses, this is how you will place my name on the people and give them my blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. So we've been receiving this blessing for three and a half thousand years that's an old blessing isn't it yeah it's it's beautiful it's wonderful so the divine service ends with the threefold name of god and his blessing and you know it's really great and the uh, author of the wonderful commentary on this book of hebrews says this well and actually just quotes luther on it too when god blesses you or when one of his servants speaks God's blessing to you. It is not just a wish. So when I wish or when I hope that you have safe travel or a happy holiday or get all the gifts that you want, that's, that's a wish. It may or may not come true, right? You may or may not have great weather, a happy holiday, and the stuff that you want. The blessing of God is different. It is not just a wish. There's no uncertainty about it. And so, and that's why we don't say things like, may the Lord bless you and keep you, because may could go either way. He may or may not bless you and keep you. Instead, it's just the Lord bless you and keep you, right? There's this certainty, this objective, factual blessing that God has spoken, he has promised, and so he will bless you and keep you. He will make his face shine on you and be gracious to you, 
And then, you know, when someone looks away or refuses to look at you, that's how you really know that they're mad at you, right? They won't even look at you. That's why you want God to lift up his countenance upon you, to look at you with favor and to give you peace, right? He looks at you, he smiles, and he loves you. That's his blessing. There's a lot of other blessings. Uh, Matins will sing next Sunday. It ends with uh, the second Corinthians has this blessing at the end. It's another Trinitarian blessing, right? And, uh, and it's there that we, uh, that we ask God, um, I'll, th- I'll think of it in a second, um, but it's, an, it's another Trinitarian blessing. In fact, I might just look it up and quote it so I get it right. That's the one that we hear at the end of Matins. You can see it in 2 Corinthians 13. And it is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it starts with Jesus, interestingly, and the love of God, that's the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Yeah, communion and fellowship, right? Same word in, in Greek. And so we, we sometimes use them interchangeably. Uh, I guess in our... With English, right, we kind of go more with uh, communion as the sacrament and fellowship as bowling and pizza, right? <laughs> but, but it's the same word in Greek, and, it, and, and they really both refer to the sacrament and the fellowship of faith and the word of God and the sacraments, right? Uh, it's not, nothing against the fellowship hall or the fellowship of bingo night, right? But, but the fellowship is really formed and centered around the word of God and the sacrament. That's the main thing, and that's why we have card night and stuff like that is because we're formed into fellows into communion and a fellowship of faith through the word. So there's another blessing. There's a whole bunch of them. There's a whole bunch. You can have a benediction every day from a different part of the Bible, but, and they're all good. They're all from God, the Holy Trinity. And here is one. I, I think this should just be one of our top ones. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. You might have noticed that he doesn't just say the God of peace who makes us feel better through Christ the Good Shepherd or the God of peace who comforts us. Uh, He does comfort us. But the way that Christ is identified as our great shepherd is that the God of peace brought him again from the dead. That's the main thing. That's the most important thing. That is how he is the great shepherd of the sheep. And Jesus says the same thing in John 10. When he says, I am the good shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep. And then I take it back up again. My father has given me authority to do this. And because of that, the sheep hear my voice and they know my name and they follow me, right? So he's, he's the great shepherd, not just because he carries us, which he does, but mainly and most importantly, because he dies for us and he rises from the dead for us. By the blood of the eternal covenant. What is that? What is the blood of the eternal covenant? It's like a direct quote from Jesus, isn't it, right? Take and drink of it, all of you. This cup is the the blood of the New Testament, right? Testament or covenant, we kind of use those interchangeably. The blood of the eternal covenant. So it's the blood shed on the cross. It's the blood received in the cup with the wine on Sunday morning. Same thing. And so one of many references to the, to the Lord's gift of the sacrament in Hebrews. So, and then equip you with everything good that you may do his will. So then you have, like, you might notice in our prayers right after communion that, that we ask God that we would uh, serve, serve him in faith toward him and in fervent love toward each other. Right? So you're, you're actually asking for help, uh, not just to have faith in God, the most important thing, but also to go out during the week and serve other people in fervent love toward other people. Right? So it's because of the grace of God and the faith he gives you that you're able to do good works and serve God in your callings and help other people as you have opportunity. So working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. So uh, God is the one working these good works in us. God is the one preparing these good things for us to do in advance. And then through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. That'd be a good place to end, right? It's not quite the ending, though. What do you call it when you put something at the bottom of the letter? Postscript. Yeah, thank you. P.S., right? P.S., I miss you or I love you or P.S., 
I forgot to mail your gifts, but it's on its way. <laughs> right? P.S. How's the dog doing? Or <laughs> how's the weather down there? You know, P.S. So there's a P.S. at the end of this letter. Let's read that. Hebrews 13, verses 22 to 25. For, thank you, Tanya. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. For I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been with me, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with you, all of you. Amen. There's another blessing or benediction, right? And now here, for the first and only time in the entire book, are two clues about who the person is and where he is from. They're not really definitive clues. They're really broad in general. So there are a few things we can assume and a few that we can't based on those clues. But uh, one thing I, I find interesting, uh, his final appeal, verse 22, that the same word I appeal to you is the same word for exhortation. And the Greek word is parakalo, and it's where we get the, a word for the Holy Spirit. You call him the paraclete. You've heard that. We sing that every Pentecost, the paraclete, the comforter, you know, the one who encourages or exhorts us, right? So that's, that's this word of I appeal, <coughs> I parakalo, and exhortation. Right, same thing, right? Appeal, encourage, comfort with my word of exhortation. Now, only a preacher would say this, right? For I have written to you briefly. <laughs> Do you know this is one of the longest letters in the New Testament? Only two of Paul's letters have more chapters. And I don't think any of them have more words. That of all the epistles, this is the longest one, and only a preacher would say, All right, now I've written to you briefly. <laughs> Only you would think it's brief, but hopefully you enjoyed it. I mean, it's, it's very encouraging and edifying. A lot of really uh, deep and wonderful scripture that has taught us, I think, the Old Testament more than almost any other New Testament book. This quotes and unpacks what the sacrifices and prophecies of the Old Testament mean today. So I appeal to you, brothers. And that's, that's not just family or biological brothers, that's spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. Bear with my word of exhortation. And then uh, Timothy is mentioned in verse 23. Italy is mentioned in verse 24. Our brother Timothy has been released. We don't, uh, we don't actually have a record of Timothy being in jail. Isn't that interesting? Uh, who do we know that was in jail? More than once. Who? Paul. Who else? Luke was, yeah. Who else? Peter certainly was. What about when they were singing in Philippi? It was Paul and Silas, remember? Those two guys, they were in jail together and they were singing, right? So a number of times that the apostles or other pastors were imprisoned. Uh, so Timothy must have been at some point too, because why else would he say that he's been released? So our brother, um, the writer of the newest commentary, John Kleinig, a wonderful Lutheran teacher in Australia, and he comes to speak here quite often. He uh, suspects that Timothy is a pastor of the same congregation as the writer to the Hebrews. Now we can rule out Timothy as the author, right? So who's, who wrote it? Uh, we don't know, but it wasn't Timothy, right? Because he says, our brother Timothy. Okay, and then the other clue, this is kind of all the way back in the beginning, but uh, one other point that we might have missed or not talked about too much is that in Hebrews 2, um, verse 3, he says, It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. It was attested by the Lord to us by those who heard. So those who heard would be the eyewitness apostles, the first eyewitness, martyrs, and confessors of the faith. So it seems from that that perhaps Hebrews was not written by one of the apostles, but by another pastor, a teacher of the faith, perhaps someone like Timothy, who was trained by Paul, or at least received his teaching, and was ordained and called to, to this congregation that he is now serving. So you should know that he'll be released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. So they're planning a visit, hopefully him and Timothy. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. So 
when Paul writes to certain places, he'll say, you know, uh, greet this guy and greet Phoebe and greet them and greet them. He'll name them, right? Here, there's just a general, greet all your leaders and all the saints, right? The whole church, everybody. And finally, those who come from Italy. Okay, so what is that? Anyone here from Italy? My grandpa came over from Sicily. Did you know that? It's not that important, but I just thought it was kind of special <laughs> to this ends by mentioning Italy. I never got to meet him. He died before I was born. But, uh, but now I kind of want to, you know, learn more about that. Where in Sicily? And, and then you're, I know what you're thinking, you know, is he related to the, to the mob, right? <laughs> but I don't know. Um, maybe just a humble farming family and a lovely Mediterranean climate of Sicily. So those who come from Italy send you greetings. Um, and uh, it doesn't seem to refer then to folks who are still in Italy, okay? Because that's not very precise. Italy is a, an entire country. Where in Italy? Rome, you know, somewhere else. Uh, so those who come from there send you greetings. It's probably folks who are originally from there, but have kind of been scattered throughout. So remember at this point, uh, most likely, the uh, Jewish people have been scattered all over the place in Asia and Northern Africa and in Europe throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. First with the Babylonian captivity or even with the Assyrians before that and, and for hundreds of years after that. So they're, they're just all over. They're not just in Israel. They're not just in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Galilee. They're, they're all over the place. So those who come from Italy, it just Sounds like folks who, uh, the study Bible note says, either those who are with the author in Italy or those who have come from Italy to the author. So there, <laughs> it's, it's not really specific. And it doesn't give us a whole lot of clues as to who wrote this, but it, it is kind of nice to, to think about that and speculate who it could be. Back at the beginning of the study, I think we, we said that some of the early church fathers said maybe it was Apollo, uh, who was a uh, co-worker with Paul and well-trained in the Greek language. Some thought it was Barnabas, another apostle, who helped bring St. Paul in and helped the other apostles accept him in his ministry. And some think it was Luke. That'd be interesting if Luke wrote this letter to the Hebrews. Uh, you compare this to the Gospel of Luke and to Acts. There's tons of things about the temple and the priests and the sacrifices and Christ the, the high priest and all that. So that, that'd be a good connection. That would make sense. And, uh, and then maybe it's just an anonymous, maybe it's just a, a Sunday sermon, right? By a pastor who will meet in heaven. And it got written and circulated and uh, as part of the New Testament Bible books. We will find out for certain in the life of the world to come. So they included the Ephesians, the way those guys that yeah, that could be. Again, there's some of the early fathers. I mean, you could look at like Jerome in the 300s or Justin Martyr of the 200s and see, you know, who who they thought wrote it. Already by that time, they they weren't certain. Another thing you might might or might not be interested to know is that there are some books about which there was uncertainty at first. So like Hebrews, Revelation, Jude. Um, without absolute certainty of who wrote it. That was one of the top criteria for it being in the Bible. Now, all these books are self-authenticating. It's not like they had a committee, and it's not like they waited till 325 with the Council of Nicaea to finally rubber stamp the 27 books. It was, they were already together in a book before that, and they were already accepted quite before that. But, uh, but because it has apostolic teaching, it was accepted despite being somewhat anonymous. Some Old Testament books are like that too. I mean, we're not absolutely sure who wrote first and second Samuel because uh, Samuel dies halfway through the first book. And uh, maybe not even certain who wrote the last verse. I mean, Moses wrote what? What's that? The first five, yeah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But he records his death in the last verse of Deuteronomy. Right, so either he wrote it prophetically or maybe Joshua wrote it after he died. See, so that, that kind of thing. Like we, we know who wrote most of the books and a few of them we don't. And that's okay. 
But the, as long as they, they teach the doctrine of Christ, they were accepted very early on. And then it was super clear also very early on that a lot of these books were not biblical, that, that they didn't belong with the scriptures, that they were not breathed out by the Holy Spirit. Uh, some because they contradicted the Bible, some because they added to or took away, uh, some because they were these Gnostic books. You hear about the Gospel of Thomas or Mary or Judas, right? These are all spurious extra fragmentary never accepted by the church writings you only hear about them on tv every christmas to try to discredit christianity <laughs> but you know how that goes they're uh, they're interesting but they are they, they were never accepted and rightly so because they, they do not teach the doctrine of christ and the apostles so hebrews is firmly uh, in the in the list of books in the New Testament, and I think it is just especially or particularly comforting and helpful for us today as we look back on all the centuries and millennia of God's saints and people, giving thanks for Christ our High Priest, and then this comfort at the end here, grace be with all of you. It's just a nice short blessing and benediction at the very end of the book. What else did you think about or what else stood out to you or popped out as we were reading the last very last section, the greetings and the blessings of Hebrews. Before next Sunday, as you have a chance, read through the whole thing again, beginning to end. And I'll challenge myself to do that too. Uh, just read it all in one sitting. I have a little graph, by the way, on how long it takes you to read each Bible book. Because this is a big book, and it's 2,000-something pages. And to sit down and read the whole Bible, I mean, you should do it, but you got to do it one section at a time. You, it's going to take quite a while to just try and tackle it all at once. Uh, but one book at a time, that's more manageable, right? It'll take you a few hours to read Genesis, but it'll only take you a few minutes to read Galatians, right? And, and so Hebrews is longer than Galatians, but even then, I mean, you can, you can read it in one sitting or you can read it in an hour or two or depending at your pace, uh, just kind of have some time and go through the whole thing at once. See how wonderfully he builds his points and teaches the people of God about Christ, our great shepherd and our high priest. See how many examples he weaves in. He talks about Moses and Joshua. He talks about Aaron and about Samson. He talks about Sarah and Eve, and Ed, he, he just goes through so many of these Old Testament saints, David and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and Judah, just richly and wonderfully tying them all together. And uh, yeah, he, he, he'll get sidetracked every now and then, as we all do, but he always gets back to the main point, and then he begins to wrap it up at the end and has uh, just these wonderful lists uh, by faith in chapter 11, and uh, the discipline of God and his kingdom in chapter 12, and then just this nice summary point by point in chapter 13 before he ends with a blessing. What else did you think of or want to talk about? So again, next Sunday is our wrap up. Uh, we'll have the PowerPoint slides and uh, pictures, at least one for each chapter and, and just a visual reminder of the wonderful doctrine, teaching and practical daily life application of Hebrews. And then I want to sing a few hymn stanzas next Sunday. So get a hymnal and we will sing a few of our wonderful hymns that are inspired directly by the words of Hebrews. Without further ado, we will end today with a blessing. And I'm going to bless you with the blessing of Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>